Hey everybody, when I hear that ring on the, uh, the phone, I think everybody starts checking their phones, you know. It's like, you know, if you're 70 years old, that might be your ringtone. It's wonderful. Reminds me of an older time. Well, my name is Brad. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace. And if you don't know me, so I spend a lot of my time working with young people, people 24 and under, and all the ministries that work with them. And what a privilege it is. I've been here for Grace for a long time, and I've seen a lot of God do a lot of great things here. And I just have the great privilege of talking today. It's been a busy summer, so people are all scattered. And you heard what Donnie had to say. Isn't that awesome about sports camps? I mean, you watch those videos, you see these kids having fun. I love that stuff. Yeah. That's great. And it's not because of our programs, like, I mean, like we're doing, like we're inventing anything. It's because Jesus Christ changed people's lives, changes people's lives. And we're seeing these young people. And imagine if the young people can see hope in Jesus at a young age and where that trajectory can take them. Because we know life is tough, you know. And so here I am today just talking to you a little bit in this series called The Call. And we've been working through things. Last week, Pastor Jeff started us off. And I would encourage you, if you weren't here last week, to go back and listen to that. Because it's such an important message. And it's talking about the call of the Father than really the call to come back to him. And it was awesome, and I really appreciate that. And today I'm going to talk about a call of something that's a little bit different. It's kind of talking about like the call of our culture. All of us all the time are being marketed and messaged to constantly, right? We always hear these messages. You know, you go, you go, you do you, boo-boo. You run after what makes you happy. You find yourself. And, it's, and the thing is, it's all stuff that comes so naturally to us, right? We're naturally running. And we feel like a lot of times, if you're ever like me, a lot of times you just feel like you're always chasing after something and just out of your grasp. So whenever I was a kid, we used to play games. I lived in, um, you know, West Central Pennsylvania in a little coal mining community where um, you're not allowed to stay in the house after 8 a.m. So my dad would wake me up in the morning and say, Brad, you're burning daylight. I'm like, Dad, it's Saturday. It's 8 o'clock. Get outside, you know. And then you know, we didn't come back in until it was dark, you know. And so we'd go play. We'd play ball. I love playing basketball, things like that. Um, but I remember we played different games. There was this horrible game. It's the worst game ever invented called Hide and Seek. Now, for some of you, you might think, oh, what's the big deal? Hide and seek. It's a fun game. I'm good at hiding. I'm stealth and all that stuff. For me, I hated that game because I hate, hate sitting still. I can't stand it. You know, I mean, if I'm in a meeting too long, I find a way to get out of it. I need to stretch my legs or something. Fake a phone call. Or, uh, don't tell anybody I said that. <laughs> you know? No, but that's how I feel. And some of you guys do that with church services, right? It's like, oh, I need to go do a phone call. Anyway, so, um, but anyway, so I remember we'd sit there. Goes, the, the rules of the game were you go sit as still as you can and hope that nobody found you for a long time. I think my parents kind of made me play that game because they were annoyed with me. Brad, just go hide real quick. We'll come find you, <laughs> you know? I was really good at it some days, it felt like. But I hated that game. But there was a really game that I hated even worse. And it was called Tag. You know, the simple game takes no equipment to play. But I was terrible at it. My dad said, I was so slow you could time me with a calendar, okay? That's how slow I was at running. I wasn't gifted with speed. And so me and my friends would go out, and the kids were older than me, and... I felt like I was constantly it. And so I'd be out there running and sweating. And I felt like I spent most of the time playing tag. I guess, oh, come on, you guys. Come on, just let me, just let me catch you one time. And I'd run. And then once in a while, the, the, the sky would open up and the sun would shine brightly on me. And I was just about ready to grab somebody. They were there. And then they got away from me, <laughs> you know, just right in my grasp. I almost had them. Oh, I'm still it. And then once in a while, on a great moment, a time where I felt super successful, I actually caught them. And I'm like, yes! And before you know it, I was it again in about five, five seconds. You know what I mean? They'd catch me again. It was my, my, my success was so short-lived. And I feel like that's how I lived a lot of my life. I feel like a lot of my life, maybe you've been there before, you feel like you're always chasing after something. If I could just get that thing, it would make me feel better. So maybe you're in high school and, you know, for me it was dating girls or whatever. It's like, if I could just get the one girl who really liked me and my friends thought that she was pretty, then I'd be okay. That will make, give me success. Or if I found popularity, if I could just be in that group of friends, if I was with that group and they would call me on a Friday night and ask me to do something. Oh, if I could just get that. And then, or maybe it was like, for me, it was like, I loved growing up. I loved sneakers. If I could just get that next pair of Jordans, that would be awesome. And if I get those, I'd feel better. Or if I could just get the newest, best thing. I felt so happy when I got my first car. I saved my money for it. And I bought it this little, so I'm 48 years old, so it kind of date me a little bit. But I, I bought this Honda CRX. It was a little two-seater car. Anybody remember those cars? You know, I thought it was so cool. It was black. It had a sunroof on it. I thought I was, I just thought I was all that. And then I met a friend of mine in college, and he had this sweet Camaro. It was black with red stripes. 
But he had a subwoofer in, in there, man. It was like, it was so loud that you'd sit in the back and my little Pittsburgh pirate hat would flutter every time the bass would hit. I mean, I thought, man, I thought I was cool, but now this guy is really cool. If I just had what he had, you know, that's why I went back to my CRX with my little Alpine stereo I got somewhere and just listened to music. It was kind of not very good, you know, so it's just where I was. I felt like I was always chasing something, but that then changed as I got older. If I could just get the next thing, or if I, if I could get people to see me as this. I always wanted people to like me. If, I, if people would just like me and they would respect me, if I could just get that position in life, if I could just get that, if I could just get married, if I could just get those things, then my life will be okay. And so what happens a lot of times, that's kind of, I feel like, the call of our culture. It's the call of our world on us all the time. We are being hit with that message constantly. Get this and you'll be great. Achieve this, find this place, and you'll have it. Get this possession, get that, and you got it. And then what? The problem is, oftentimes it come up empty. But this isn't something new for us today. 2021 didn't invent that. The, the 2000s didn't invent that. That's been around for a long time. And I know that because as I read through the Bible, I see some of the same challenges being addressed to people that are addressed to me. And so we're going to talk in this passage of Scripture today from the book of 1 John. So in the Bible, there's a book called John, which is the gospel. So if you look at the Bible, there's two testaments, Old Testament, New Testament. New Testament talks about Jesus' life and those things. And then there's four kind of accounts of Jesus' life called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there's that. But then that John, we're not sure, but we believe that he wrote this next three books of the Bible. They're towards the end called 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And so what we would, if this is the John that Jesus was with, you know, if you read through his gospel, you see he referred to himself as the, the one that Jesus loved. He was tight with Jesus. Jesus had his 12 followers, but then he had his inner circle of three guys, and John was one of them. So Jesus, John would see Jesus do, you know, feed people with just a little bit of bread. He would saw him do miracles. He would saw him walk on the water. He would saw incredible things. But then he would saw him also die on the cross. And then, he would see, and he would see the empty tomb, which we just sang about. He would find all of those things. Well, now we're moving on down in John's life. Most of John's friends, that group that he was with, have all been martyred. And now here's John as an old man writing this letter. And he's writing this to a group of people who are followers of Jesus. And he's kind of, this first John, so there's three letters there, first, second, and third John. And this first one, he's kind of writing this long kind of sermon that kind of summarizes all that he wrote in, in the Gospel of John. And so he writes out this thing, and he kind of goes on to talk about, you know, if we you know, believe in Jesus, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, so forgive us our sins. He writes about if you're in the light, like God is in the light, you know, there won't be any darkness in you, and we should live in the way that Jesus lived. And so right in that story, this wise old man who lived a long life looks at these younger followers, and he says, here, I have a warning for you. So I think any time in our lives, it's always good to look at generations ahead of us. We can learn a lot from them. Because people have experiences, and they've lived life, right? And when people live life, I learned a lot from my parents. I remember when I was 22 years old, calling my dad and saying, Dad, you were right. I was wrong about so many things. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm sorry, Mom. Because I learned from them. They taught, they taught me a lot of stuff. So I think when we look at what John has to say here, it'd be, it'd be important for us to grab a hold of it. And so he gives this warning in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. He starts off, he goes right after it. He doesn't mess around. He doesn't kind of tiptoe. He goes right after it. And this is what he writes. He goes, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Don't love the world, he says, or anything in the world. Now, as you read through the Bible, you, obviously we know he's not talking about planet Earth. Like, I don't think God wants us to have an opinion of not loving the planet or something like that. I mean, that's just you know, um, ground and dirt and water and all that stuff. And obviously we know he's not talking about people. Because Jesus says, a new command I give you, that you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Who's my neighbor? And then he goes on and tells a story about really everybody. We need to love people like Jesus did. So we know he's not talking about the world itself, you know, the physical world, or he's talking about the people, but really what he's talking about, and we'll find out here in a minute, are the philosophies and systems of the world. The motivations of the world, if you will. The call of the world for us for how we should love, live our lives. The norm for us. The thing that feels like it's so natural to us. You know, the thing that is always pulling us to go. So then he goes on and describes some of what it looks like. He's, I mean, he goes, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. 
And then he says, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. That thing you're chasing, those motivations you have. So I, I kind of look at these verses and I see there's basically two, two types of motivation that come from them. The first one is easy as we talk about. It says, don't love the world. We are called every day by the world to live a certain way. You make yourself happy, you make yourself successful, you pick yourself up by the bootstraps, you work hard, you find success, you save money, you build a retirement, you do these things. We're called all the time about to do it. You know, you find, find relationships and if, if that relationship's not good for you, you move on to the next one because you gotta protect yourself. You gotta take care of you. All the time we're told these motivations. You know, do what it takes to be successful. Do what it takes to run hard. And we're always hit with these different messages. And so it's nothing, so we look at these two types of motivation. The first one is the love of the world. And then John goes in to describe what this looks like a little bit. And he says this, again, back in 16, for the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now those are things some of us have heard before. But like, look at words like that. And so when I kind of think about these different things, I kind of write them like this. Well, um, the first one, the lust of the flesh, is when we chase pleasure, looking for meaning. There's nothing wrong with pleasure. We don't have to feel bad. If we enjoy something or have fun, we shouldn't feel bad about it. You sit in a movie, you're having fun, and you laugh, it's like, oh boy, I, should, I probably should be sad and think about all the bad things in the world. No, it's okay to have pleasure. It's okay to enjoy your meal. You have the food sat before you. It's okay to have things like that. It's okay, you know what I mean? We talk about sex, right? Sex is a, is a pleasurable thing. And God says there's nothing wrong with sex, except if you do it these things. What happens is, he goes, when we chase pleasure, looking for our meaning. So many times what happens in our world, and our world's cry is, it's not just enough to have pleasure, but you need to keep running after it, where it becomes a lust, where it's a craving, a deep desire is to find our meaning in that pleasure. So I want to have fun, so I'm going to orchestrate my whole day to make it as easy as possible so I can go have as much fun as possible. I'm going to look, jump from one experience to the next because I want to find pleasure to do it. Food. It's like, why have one hamburger when you can have two? It's right. Oh, it's like, oh, there's another one. All you can eat, right? The refillable sodas. I love those things. It's like, boy, you know, give me more. And I just keep filling them up. You know, it's, it's nothing wrong with having, having food and those types of things. But it's when you look at those things as we're part of your meaning and where you're finding meaning. I think comfort's another one. This is one we don't talk about a whole lot. I think some of us, what happens, the world says, hey, just work hard to be comfortable. Get a nice, comfortable, nice life where you have enough, where you can relax, where you feel safe and all those things. And what happens is we look for comfort and we start pursuing that and doing whatever it takes to make our life more comfortable. So we'll say no to good things because it's like, ah, I don't want to be pushed out of my comfort zone here. You know, I, I, you, hey, why don't you go do this? It's like, eh, I'm not sure I want to try something new. I feel nice and comfortable. Hey, why don't you go be friendly to that person? Help them out. It's like, oh, I'm just kind of comfortable where I am. With parents, we do this with our children sometimes. It's like, there's not, like, we look at our children, we enjoy the pleasure of being a parent as long as they stay in line with what they want to do. Hey, but we have expectations and plans for them for their lives, right? And it's like, and our comfort is when they're close by. Oh, now my child's talking about moving away or doing something. It's like, oh, we get a little scared about that sometimes. What happens is when we chase pleasure, we're looking for meaning sometimes. And so look at those lives. So when Paul says, I mean, when John says about the lust for the flesh, he's talking about chasing pleasure for meaning, finding meaning in our pleasures. The next thing he says, um, it talks about the, um, the lust of the eyes. When we, search, when we chase possessions, searching for satisfaction. When we chase after things, if I can just get that next best thing, I'm going to be great. So picture me playing chase as a kid where you're just running from one thing to the next, trying to grab that person. And in the end, most of the time we end up like, come on, you guys, I'm tired. And a lot of times this is how we live our lives. If I could just get in a little bit nicer house. If I could just get a nicer car. And it's like, man, I got a phone. A cell phone works great. I can text. I can call and everything. Well, what's that? A new phone came out? Oh, well, hello. I've got to be on the cutting edge. I've got to be on the front of that. And a lot of times we find possessions to be our, that's what we find satisfaction in. If I can just get this. So for sometimes it's like, well, if I can just get a nice house. You know, my parents had a nice house. So if I could just get a nice house. Oh, what? And I got one house. Well, maybe I should have another one. If I could just get a car, I remember I felt good about my car until I saw my buddies. It was so much cooler than what I had. You know, when I got my, my new pair of shoes, it's like, these are great until the next ones came out. I don't know what it is that um, the possession that drives you in, but I do know the amount of marketing that is in our world. I know that we as people oftentimes look to possessions for our satisfaction. 
We want the newest and what's best. You got to have this. If you just get this, it'll make you happy. And John has given us the warning. Don't love the world. Don't look for pleasures for your meaning. Don't look possess for to possessions for your satisfaction. And then the last one, when we chase status, looking for our worth. A lot of times we have to make ourselves achieve some type of status so that we feel better about ourselves. Because if we can get that status, well then maybe I have worth. And maybe I really do have value. So if you're single, you think, well, I guess I got to get married because that's what, I guess I'm supposed to get married because people get married. Well, I got to get married so that I'm viewed, so I feel like I have worth. Or maybe if you feel like you're in a job, you're thinking, I got to get that promotion. And it's not even necessarily to get the, and there's nothing wrong with getting promotions and all that stuff. And we should be successful. We should be the, Christians, Christ followers should be the hardest working people around. And you get rewarded with that sometimes. But when you chase those things for your worth, that's your love, your love, it's the love of the world. And so what happens sometimes is we chase a, a position. If I just work harder, if I just, maybe I'll cut a corner here, or maybe I'll just cheat the family a little bit here. I'll catch up with my family later, but right now, this season, I gotta go because I gotta give them what they really need or what they really want. But a lot of times we do it so that we're viewed as successful. So we're viewed as having worth. I remember being in high school wanting to be on this varsity team. Well, then you make the varsity team. Now I want to be a starter. Now I want to be a starter. Now I'm a starter. I want to be the highest scorer. I want my name to be on the headline. And you're just always chasing status. I wasn't chasing those things because this is a God-honoring way for me to live my life. I'm honoring God by using my talents for him. I was chasing those things because I wanted myself to feel better. I remember there was times... This is, t this is totally vulnerable here. I remember times getting a girlfriend just because I wanted to feel better about myself that somebody picked me. What happens is we choose those things and if we're looking and we're chasing after it and if we chase after those things to get our worth, what happens when we grab it and it doesn't satisfy? Because John then goes on and says, he talks about these things. He talks about these motivations and he says, these are the, the chasing after that stuff, it will all pass away. And we've seen that, right, in our lives, right? Because we've got some of those things that we thought would, would solve it. We got that perfect relationship. We thought that would solve it. And then we got in a relationship and realized, it's like, boy, just didn't quite hit me like I thought it would. We got that perfect promotion. We think, yes, that perfect job. Yes. And then they're like, that's fun, but I still feel like there's got to be something more. Is that it? Is that all there is? You see this with athletes. They get to the penultimate time where they get the biggest trophy in all of sports. They get that and they, in the end they remember, they say, is that all there is? And they celebrate like crazy, but in, in moments of clarity, they realize it passes away. That's right. And so John is not writing us a warning because he's like, hey, I don't want you guys to have any fun. When you're on this earth, I just want you to sit and just to think all the time and be bored. No, he's not telling us that. He's like, I don't want you to have stuff. He's not telling us warnings so we don't own things. He's not telling us warnings so we don't try to achieve things. But what he's warning us of is don't give in to the systems where we look to those things for our meaning because they can't deliver. Don't look to those things for our satisfaction because they will let us disappointed. Don't look to those things for our worth because you're worth much more than what those things would tell you. And so John gives us a warning because he knows what's best for us. And so the first motivation, loving the world, and says the world is desires, they pass away. You know, I've, I've had the privilege of being at a lot of funerals. And it's amazing what doesn't matter then. I've been, I've been in a sick bed where I've watched a person pass away and you realize how little things matter. He goes on, but there's another motivation. The thing about that first one is the hard part is it's me. That's how I feel. I'm motivated by myself all the time. When I wake up in the morning, what can I do for me? I love me some me. The second motivation is this. What God desires what God desires, what he has for us. And this is the desires John talks about in 17. He says these things, but it's like the world and its desires pass away. The, the lust of the flesh, the lust, uh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, chasing things for meaning, chasing things for satisfaction, chasing um, a position and status for worth, finding our identity in those things. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. The second motivation is doing the will of God. And what is that? What is the will of God? What does the, doing the will of God look like? It's simple by saying this. It's Jesus. The call of the culture all the time is you do you, you live for yourself. Where the call to do the will of God is follow Jesus. We chase so much in our lives. Brad, myself, I've chased so many things and come up empty. But Jesus simply says, come follow me and I'll give you eternal life. Come follow me and I'll give you what you're really looking for. 
Come follow me because what you're looking for can't be found out there. The world does not know unconditional love. I'll demonstrate it for you real quick. The world out there tells you you've got to do these things to be successful and you've got to find your worth this way. Jesus is like, listen, I made you and I value you and I've known you from the beginning. The, and the, the world tells us all these things and Jesus is like, listen, when I, knew you, when I saw you at your worst moment, that's when I stepped into your world and died for you. So what happens is though, the first motivation feels so natural. I don't have to tell myself how to be greedy. I never taught myself that. I never taught myself how to take advantage of people. It comes naturally. I never taught myself how to have selfish motives. It all, all, motives. It all comes naturally. But following Jesus is so much different than that. And it feels totally unnatural. Because it comes from faith by stepping out in faith. So when Jesus looked at his followers, and one of those times it was John and his brother, and he looked at them and says, come follow me. What he was asking them to do was to step out in faith. To do an unnatural thing and say, step out. I'm going to say, I'm going to put all of my eggs in that basket. I'm going to go all in. And John, John describes it in John 3. He says, if, you know, if, if we believe in Jesus, then we can have eternal life. Whoever believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. And what belief and faith is, it's stepping out because you can't, might not see how it is, but it's trusting God that he knows what he's talking about. See, every day I see the call of the culture, call look out for myself. I see possessions, I see status, I see um, pleasures that I can pursue. And I struggle with pursuing those things every day. But Jesus is like, listen, I want you to step out in faith and follow me. But let me tell you something. If you go look up here for a second, Jesus knows how hard it is to run after him. Jesus knows how unnatural it is for us to put our trust completely into somebody else. Because if Jesus didn't, need to, didn't know that, why would John have to warn us against it? And Jesus knows the call he's asking us because Jesus isn't just asking you to show up and do religious activities. Jesus is like, just go to church, be nice to your neighbor, put some money in the black boxes or text it if you'd like. Um, he's not telling us just to do those things. What Jesus is again is with this motivation to do the will of the Father is the will of God is this. It's a call to die to yourself. To say, I know the way that I'm living. I know if I go my own path, it will lead to pain and ultimately destruction. I know that when I go to grab things, that I always come up them empty. I might have success for a little bit, but that feeling is short-lived. And Jesus said, like, so agreeing with God that the way I'm living is wrong and the way, I li the way I'm living is fruitless. And I know that way is going to pass away. And it's turning from that and turning to Jesus. Say, but Jesus, in faith, I'm going to step out to you. I'm going to go all in and trust you with everything. And we ask God to come into our lives, to take away the junk, turn our wax from that. And he gives us new life. The reason why we sing about the empty tomb was because our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ, stepped out of it. And he says, us, you, follow me. Stop chasing. Because you're never going to find it. And start following me. But here's the question. A lot of us, we know this truth. I know this truth very well. I grew up in a church. I went to cemetery, I call it. I went through all that stuff. You know, grew and you learned a lot about the Bible. I know in my head a lot of this stuff. But a question I have to ask myself, because I don't always live it. And here's the question I want us to think about. Do you believe that Jesus is worth it? In your heart of hearts, do you really believe he's worth you stepping out of what you're naturally good at? Stepping out of the wave where everyone else is going and say, I'm going to lay down my life to follow him. No longer am I going to, I'm going to fight to not be motivated by myself. I'm going to try to find my worth in you alone, Jesus. I'm going to trust that you're going to deliver. Do you believe that he's worth it. And you have to ask yourself that honestly. Because if it's just an activity you do, you will come up empty with that too. If following Jesus is just going to church and just chasing spiritual highs, you're going to come up empty as well. It has to be about you putting your whole life into his. Is it worth it? Is Jesus worth it? We know that Jesus Christ, 
when the Bible says that everything that was made was made through him. He is our maker. And when he knew before, the, before time existed, he knew that you would exist. And he made you and formed you. And he gave you purpose in life. When Jesus, when we are people who are used to conditions for our love, he in an unconditional way stepped into our world and says, love me. There's, you can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to make me love you more. Jesus said, I love you completely as you are. There's nothing you can do to make me love you less. I love you completely as you are right now. In the book of Romans, it says, but Jesus, when we were still as sinners, when we were at our worst, Christ Jesus died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up because he knows we can't do it. Because if we could clean ourselves up, we would have already captured it. We would have done it. But we all chase after, by nature, things that lead to emptiness. But God loves us in his mercy. Think about who Jesus was as you read through his stories in the Bible. When there were people in the world that everyone else looked down on because of their racial background or whatever, Jesus Christ reached out to them and brought them into his family. Because of his love for people, we know, well, it's like if I'm going to be motivated by Jesus, I'm going to start loving people the way that he did. We don't love people because, hey, it's socially acceptable to do. We love people because Jesus loved people. And I want to be motivated like him. When there, when there was a person with leprosy walking through the village and everyone else has to yell out, unclean, unclean, and stay away from him. Jesus reached out and touched him and healed him. But he drew him close. When people said, oh, those people are, are sinners, they're criminals, they're, they're thieves. When everyone cast them out and marginalized them, Jesus ate with them and drew them into his family. If he did that for, those, for you know, the people all throughout scripture, how much more can he demonstrate his love than by stepping into our world and dying for a people that he knew would struggle every day to love him? The amount of times that I've known Jesus was best for me and I've turned my back on him, yet he keeps calling me back. There's no such thing as a lost cause, but it's because Jesus is worth it. So when we look at our lives, one motivation Lee will leave us chasing. It will always have us on the run. It's what's no normally, it's culturally acceptable to chase after those things. To become great in our own eyes. To become, to become uh, pursuing pleasures and pursuing, pursuing possessions. It's culturally acceptable when you can fit right in with everybody else. It's easy. And Jesus knows it's the natural thing we do. But he gives us the opportunity for something better. Will you love me, he says. Come on, follow me. Because when we follow him, in him we find what it is we're really looking for. And we begin to live like him. And begin to become the light and the salt of the earth, as he talked about. So the question is, do you believe that he's worth it? Like in your heart, do you believe it? And if you're like me, it's a day-to-day -day thing. Because a lot of times I still try to find my hope in other things. And what happens is, we start finding in Jesus the things we're really looking for. So when we chase after pleasures to look for our meaning, we come up empty. But when we follow Jesus, we find our identity. We find who we are supposed to be. We find in him, instead of, instead of saying all the things we're not, Jesus says, here's who you are. Yeah, but God, I've really messed up. Right, but you're my child now. We find our identity as a child of God. But, but I didn't, I mean, I still have a long way to go. Right but you're my child. He brings us into his family. So when we follow Jesus, we discover our identity. When we follow Jesus, we find community. Listen, our world's been in a tough place these last couple years, right? This world is hurting. And we've tried. You know, this generation is the most, the most connected generation ever. They have the most friendships, digitally, all that stuff. Yet it would be described as the loneliest generation that's ever existed. Do you know Why? Because we're not meant to live alone. But when we're always seeking after our own things, satis looking for satisfaction from Instagram posts, from likes and those things, from status, from worth, from we don't find what we're looking for. And we just end up deeper and deeper in despair.
And so what we do is we try to find another, another thing to help us do it. But when we follow Jesus, we find community. You know, God says that the love of Jesus is so deep that not only did he create us and make us fearfully and wonderfully made, but then he says he adopts us as sons and daughters of God. And he gives us a family. And a family looks all different. It's wonderful. And God brings people from all places who said, I'm willing to trust in you because it doesn't matter where you come from. What matters is who do you know? And when we follow him, he brings us in family. He makes us connected together. Are you tired of being alone? Are you tired of the loneliness that comes from those things? Instead of just trying to find it by going, jumping into another relationship or thinking, well, my marriage is going to solve this or whatever, my family is going to deliver. Your marriage can't handle this pressure. Your family can't. Because we the people are trying to put good things like family and make them God things and it becomes really a bad thing. So if we put our trust in Jesus and follow him, we find community, we find people. So why do we show up for church? It's not just for information. You can find that on the internet. It's not just for good music. You can find good music on the internet. We show up to church to, to, together as a family to assemble and then go on mission together. But when we follow Jesus, we find community. But when we chase our own things, we come up empty. And we follow Jesus, we, we find our purpose. We see our purpose. The three biggest things that we're looking for in life are identity, belonging, and purpose. And in Jesus, we can find all of those. Because here's how I know. Because he made us. And as our maker, he designed us and crafted us. And he put us on a path. And when he put us on his path, he said, here's exactly some specific works I have for you to do. And he knows us. And if you know your maker, and if the maker makes something, he knows what the thing was made for. So if you want to know what your purpose is, it's not by searching inside of yourself. Searching inside of yourself is going to leave you empty. Because you, you, you change all the time, like I do. Right? I, wanted, I have a degree in biology. Then I wanted to become a pastor. That's, that's what happens when you search for your own thing. You know, you spend a lot of time in organic chemistry. That was worthless time. I don't even understand how it's even redeemable. But I was searching after my own thing. I thought, well, if I just get some satisfaction from money, if I get something because I can be comfortable in life. But then when I fixed my eyes on Jesus, it changed. And I found out what God made me to do. The only way you find out what God made you to do is by, by focusing on him. So when we follow Jesus, we see our purpose. So how do we do it? And that's, uh, I'd love to turn in this verse to Hebrews chapter 12. I encourage you to read this sometimes because Hebrews chapter 11 is a great passage of scripture. It talks about these people that gave up their lives and lived their lives for a better country, for something that was out there. And then the writer of Hebrews talks about that since, we, since all these people went before us and they were living for a better place, this, the world, it says, was not worthy of them. That's how incredible these people were. He said, here's what he says. And here's the prescription for how to do, to, to be motivated by Jesus. Because it's easy to talk about our problems, but if we can't fix them, what, what good is it? He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance to race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and, perf and perfecter of faith. You want to know how to be motivated by Jesus. It doesn't come from working harder. Instead, it starts this way. And he talks about here. His first one is keep your eyes on the prize. If you're a Christ follower, you've already won. You've already found a community. You're already a family with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He conquered the grave. He's going to be able to take care of us. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Put our eyes on the prize. Well, I think what happens sometimes is we make following Jesus as something socially we do. or And this is what I do sometimes. Sometimes it just becomes like another task. It's just another thing that I do. God should not be our number one priority. He is the priority. When, and so what we do, is so we can put our eyes on the prize. So here, I'm just going to give some simple things that I do. We're all different, but I think sometimes we overcomplicate fixing our eyes on Jesus. Sometimes we think, oh, it's got to be a certain way. It's got to be that. All that stuff is. But I think we're actually really good at learning how to obsess ourselves over somebody. Right? And that's what I think we should do, be obsessed with knowing Jesus. Because um, I, I'm married, you know, and I've been married for 23 years. Um, but I didn't have, no one had to teach me how to be obsessed with my wife when we were dating. You know, I started dating, we, we started hanging out. I got the butterflies. I'm like, oh, this, this girl's pretty good. You know, she's really nice. You know, I was like, okay. I wonder if we see each other again. So I tried to make another appointment to see her. 
I set up another time to see her. And when I, when I wasn't with her, guess what I did? I thought about her all the time. I'm just like, oh man. And I'd smell something, I'm like, oh, that reminds me of that time. You know, I mean, just constantly. And we live states away, but somehow we stayed in contact with each other. We wrote each other letters. Oh, I write letters. And then she'd write me a letter, and it would come. I'd be like, ah, there's a letter. No, I'd rip that thing open. Oh, it smelled like her. Oh, I'm reading through this. Oh, it's so great. I would take this thing that looked like a jelly bean and drag it with the cord into my room at home, and I'd call, it was a phone, and I'd call her, because we didn't have cell phones back then, and we'd talk. Listen, following Jesus, fixing our eyes on him is being obsessed with knowing him. The only thing way we can do that is by with time and time and just being there. So I'd encourage you, read the Bible. But you don't read the Bible so that you can find nice things to put up on Instagram. But read the Bible to see Jesus. So if you haven't been reading the Bible or if you feel like it's just kind of like it's just not, it's just not doing it for me, I would encourage you to go to like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to go to John and just obsess yourself. Keep your eyes fixed on him and learn from him. I listen to a lot of music, like the stuff we sing here, like a lot of worship music. And it's not always my style, or my preference, but I listen to those things because it ri- reminds me of Jesus. I, I have friends that know Jesus too. And so I surround myself with my friends, and guess what I get excited about sometimes? Sometimes they talk to me about Jesus, and then I can tell them what I saw about Jesus. It's like, man, it's just a whole little love story talking, right? You know, we're, we're just talking about how great Jesus is, right? And so that's what happens. But I need constantly to remind myself that there's a prize out there and his name is Jesus. Because do you know why? Because everything in my nature tells me not to do it. By nature, it's like, Brad, you don't, don't waste your time. Find your own answers. My nature's constantly pulling me away. So I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. Because that's when I fix my eyes on Jesus, he helps me to see the opportunity to drop the baggage. What happens is, Jesus is the only one who can help us with our issues. And what issues I'm talking about aren't necessarily, you know, medical issues or stuff like that. What I'm talking about are the things that we carry around that are always reminding us of who we're not. The guilt from the sins we've done in the past. The devil loves to work in that. The Bible tells us if you you confess your sins, God's faithful and just, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He takes them away. The devil wants to remind us. Remember what you did that time? Oh, I see you raising your hands in church. (laughs) I know what you did. Man, and what happens is the baggage can get so overwhelming. But when I fix my house in Jesus, I remember who the real Jesus is. I remember it's like, wait, I'm not guilty of that anymore. The other way the devil works, the evil one, shame. You should be so embarrassed. If the people knew what you did when you were 15, oh my goodness, they wouldn't be letting you lead a Bible study. Oh, they wouldn't, oh, this church walls would fall down if people really knew. You should be embarrassed. There's no shame in following Jesus. Because when we choose to follow Jesus, we give our lives to him, we're a child of the king. We can boldly go before God and walk as people who've been changed. When shame comes up in our lives, that's the evil one. He's working overtime because he knows if he can get you embarrassed, he knows he can get you sitting still. And the last thing he does is fear. If he can make you afraid. How many things have you not done because you've been afraid? What happens if? And God's saying, follow me. But if I go all in with you, Jesus, what if you don't deliver? Get away from the fear. That's the most common thing throughout the Bible that Jesus that is written in there. Don't be afraid. The devil, though, he works in guilt, he works in shame, and he works in fear over time. And sometimes we have sin in our life we need to get rid of. There are things that hold us back. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, he points those out to us. And instead of saying, hey, listen, get those things cleaned up and then come. Go fix yourself and then I'll, maybe I'll accept you. Or go prove it to me and then come back. Jesus says, just lay them down at my feet. I already paid the price for them. You've already won. The tomb is empty. Your sins are forgiven. Now, the last thing is, now run freely. Man, start living. I know it's hard. We get so beat down by life and we're always reminded of all the things which we're not and all the ways we've failed. And sometimes we got to own some of that. We ask God to forgive it. He cleanses us for that. But we forget that we know the king of kings. We are not just people in a, in a small little portion of the United States that are just trying to figure out how to exist. 
We are created beings by God that God moved from death and brought to life and brought into his family. We are eternal beings that can have eternal life and can have eternal hope and can have all the time we want with Jesus in the world. We know the king. Why are we, run, why are we just bouncing through life, just trying to get from one day to the next? If you've ever asked yourself, there's got to be more to life than this, then I'm telling you that there is. If you've ever felt like I'm just barely existing, let alone living, Jesus wants us to live. Now life's hard. We get beat down by stuff. Jesus knows that. And that's why Jesus is the king of empathy. When Jesus saw the crowd, he saw them as harassed and helpless. And he had, was moved with compassion. Jesus has compassion because he knows he walked on this earth. He paid the ultimate price. He knows how hard it is to live. But he wants you to keep running. But the only way you can do that is if you start at the top of the list. It's by fixing your eyes on him. We serve an incredible God. So I'd encourage you, if you're not yet a Christ follower, we love that you're here. And God loves you so deeply. But if you're not yet a Christ follower and you're just kind of checking it out, what I would encourage you to look at your life and just say, what in my life am I running after? What am I chasing? And if I get that, will it deliver? And I would encourage you, would you consider following Jesus? Consider, is he real? And we'd love to talk to you if you have any questions. We're just trying to figure out things, but we'd love to talk to you. But if you are a Christ follower, you know, you've, you've made a decision to follow him. God adopted you as his son or daughter. Yet you're running after things of the world. You're chasing stuff. I'd encourage you, stop chasing. It's time to start following. Get back to following. Because let me tell you, that baggage is heavy. And you're not on this earth just to exist. You're on here to run freely for him. And if you are a Christ follower who's been running, but man, it gets hard sometimes, keep going. But keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And let me tell you, it is worth it. He is a God who keeps his promises. And because of that, we can sing today and praise him today. So the band's gonna come out now as I pray. Dear God, I just thank you for the time where we could be together. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in our lives. Lord, you know us at our worst. You know how we really feel. You know how we really think, Lord. Yet you forgive us and you'll redeem us. Lord, when we felt that we were unlovable, unworthy, Lord, you stepped off the mountain, stepped out of heaven and stooped into our world, Lord, to demonstrate your love for us and to save us, not because of how great we are, but because of your mercy. So Lord, I really pray that right now you'll do an incredible work in our hearts. Lord, for my friends today who are feeling beat down in life, Lord, I pray that they will know that you're loved, that they are loved deeply by you. For my friends in here today who are not sure they wanna follow you, or not really sure, and they, when they ask the question, are you worth it, Lord? They're not sure. Lord, I pray that in a supernatural way, you'll show them that they are loved. And Lord, for my friends who are just running and fighting a good fight, Lord, and they just keep on, Lord, and they're wondering, Lord, is it worth it? Lord, I pray that you just keep giving them the strength that they need. You are a great God. And Lord, because of that, we pray in your name, amen.